awesome. So this was kind of like the Airbnb before there was Airbnb, right? Yeah, absolutely. So 99 was uh, nearly 10 years before Airbnb. Um, so yeah, we were pioneers. So it was, um, you know, it was quite something to see in their pitch deck to Sequoia that they, uh, that they, they, it's published on the internet in 2009. They actually had couch surfing in my logo. And that was actually part of the pitch deck to Sequoia. It's like, hey, let's copy these little guys down in Australia and uh, raise 500K and launch a unicorn. So That's that was kind of pleasing. <laughs> and then I heard they got laughed out of the room a couple of times. Apparently. <laughs> so um, being the first in Australia to do this, what were some of the challenges that you faced? Yeah, well, look, in 99, it was a completely different world to um, the sort of ecosystem that we have today. I only had one conversation with a venture capitalist, and uh, his advice was, man, if you want to raise 250, we don't get out of bed for less than five, so um, sell your house and best of luck. So I did. <laughs> wow, you did sell your house. Yeah, absolutely. So it was the only way to get cash in those days, and um, yeah, I started off with, you know, 60,000 bucks and a whole lot of hope. Well, I'm glad it paid off for you. <laughs> what did the real estate market look at that look like at that time? Yeah, so you know, it was um, it was the very early days of technology in real estate. So we were kind of um, trailing off the back of uh, realestate.com that was putting a computer into the offices of real estate agents, and so one person had access to the internet and they could type up adverts, and so it was it was sort of very early days. And I, I remember I used to place ads in the newspaper to um, get people to, to sign up to the site. And I'd go out with a digital camera that probably cost about $3,000 in today's terms and take, you know, um, 70 pictures um, <laughs> across 10 houses. And, um, you know, you'd sit there and it would take five minutes and for them to load on a 56K <laughs> dial-up and so on. And so, you know, it was both uh, tears of joy and pain to see hundreds of properties get fed through XML, you know, kind of three years later. Yeah. And so technology very quickly um, immersed itself through the, the real estate space, thankfully. <laughs> Is that something that you predicted would happen or you just kind of fell into it? Yeah, well, we, th we thought the internet was going to be big, you know, and there were cameras out there. But um, I must say it probably took like five years before I really knew what <laughs> I was doing. So what are some of the things that you think made you so successful? Yeah, look, it's, it's one hell of an obstacle course to, to get through a startup journey. And, you know, you think you're climbing Everest, but really um, you're just doing the whole Himalayan range. <laughs> you're carrying the bags like a Sherpa. You're, um, you're literally last to bed. You're first up in the morning. And um, uh, there are so many traps and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, successes along the way. And I think the, the key thing for me was it was probably resilience, really, out of all the things, you know, there are, there are a number of things that come into it, you know, whether you made the right decisions, whether you had the right capital, whether you had the right team, but really just the resilience, you know, believing in yourself and driving forward um, and trying to corral the resources and be as creative as possible to, um, to realize your vision. So how did the acquisition from Fairfax come about? Yeah, so a um, bit of hustle, um, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, you know, picture post GFC, it's like 2009, and uh, I've been working with a, um, a venture capital firm that was interested in investing in, in the business. And, um, you know, the global financial crash came along, <laughs> and uh, I get a call from the VC on Black Monday, and he says, Mate, I'm really sorry the deal's off. And I said, Fantastic, that's great. <laughs> Keep in touch, and, uh, you know, we'll see at the finish line. And, um, the reason I was so pleased was because that whole process of kind of um, appraising the business, understanding what the drivers were from a valuation perspective, kind of gave me a, a greater sense of, of what the business was worth and what the opportunity was. And so I thought, right, given it's a cash crunch, um, there won't be funding out there to grow this business, what can I next do? Um, so I thought, I know, I'll go and talk to my competitor, because um, we were kind of number two and number three in the market relative to stays. And so um, we caught up, we had coffee, and I said, look, I've got this vision, which is to bring our businesses together to create something more meaningful and have a real go at the number one, and potentially create something that's acquirable. And so I, uh, we met up at kind of 
20 paces and we agreed to share like five numbers and um, we just knew that some of the parts was like far greater than number two and number three. So we had one meeting to sort of share the numbers. We had another meeting to kind of scratch out the term sheet and uh, literally we met in September. We'd kind of agreed on the term sheet by December and by January we were, um, you know, signed the deal and we were doing strategic planning and so forth. Wow. So we, we then went into stealth mode and um, we popped up five months later. We'd synergized our businesses. So we only had a 10% overlap between our inventory and uh, what we did was we cross-published that on our respective sites. Um, we increased our pricing to normalize them. Um, we optimized our team. So we're both a team of about 10 people each and um, they were more engineering. We were more sort of sales service and product. So it was kind of a great fit. And um, we, we went live with the announcement and uh, I got on a jet plane <laughs> and I went to the States and I thought I'll go and talk to my friends at, uh, at HomeAway and, and TripAdvisor and see if they'd like to uh, pick up 20,000 properties bookable um, from the Australian market as a distribution deal. <laughs> and of course they were like, hey, we'd love to talk to you about um, acquiring the company. So, yeah, we started a process from there. We were lucky enough to have um, eight bidders or so. Wow. Um, so, you know, the big names in, in sort of uh, digital properties across Australia. And, um, yeah, we came back, um, started a process, and uh, it was so fortuitous because I had this, um, this investment advisor who, who rang literally the week I'd got back from the States. And um, it, was, it was a hell of a trip to the States because I kind of pitched a home way, but also um, just jammed the switchboard at TripAdvisor trying <laughs> to five, five digit extensions that got me through to like corporate development, <laughs> someone that was going to buy businesses. So managed to get a three hour <laughs> meeting with them. And um, you know, to have the founder of TripAdvisor fly out to talk to you about um, yeah. acquiring the business is, uh, you know, is quite something. Yeah. But you know, as it turns out, um, we, we, we went on with, with stays and that was great. So you stayed on as, uh, stayed on as like a leadership role. Um, what were some of the things that you did to grow the business then now that you, you know, had more resources? Yeah, so um, I guess with, with the rent-a-home and the take-a-break business that became occupancy, yeah. we'd really sort of focused on um, product and, you know, build and they will come. And I think one thing that, that Fairfax and Stays um, did really well was, was um, leverage their audiences. And, um, you know, it was great to have a, an engineering team and a product team and a marketing team mm -hmm. that could sort of lift the game to enterprise standard and accelerate the growth of the business. And what we realized was really you couldn't grow a business if um, you couldn't grow the industry. And so it was about, um, yeah, it was about that time that we realized we had to uh, start the conversation around the regulation of short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. um, and so that meant sticking our heads up above the parapet and really starting to talk about a code of conduct, um, starting to talk about um, you know, ways that we could bring holiday and short-term rentals into the travel space um, so it was uh, you know, an acceptable um, accommodation offering. Yeah. So what effect did Airbnb come, you know, wh what effect did they have when they came in the market? Yeah, so Airbnb, um, you know, full credit, <laughs> full credit to them for executing yeah. um, and delivering an amazing product and experience. And I think about, um, you know, the innovator's dilemma. And uh, I don't know if you guys have read that book, um, Christian Clayton and um, Clayton Christensen. Um, <laughs> and so the innovator's dilemma is, um, it's quite fascinating because successful businesses don't want to self-disrupt. And we were a disruptor that got disrupted. <laughs> so here I was on the first of the S curves, um, creating this online booking system. And here comes Airbnb. And just as I'm starting to plateau, they kick on with the next wave of um, you know, online bookable furnished accommodation. And I think what they got right was, and it was part of it was timing. Yeah. Um, it was um, you know, social networks. It was beautiful product. It was raising capital and it was mobile. And those were things that didn't exist back in 99. But I guess one of my big mistakes was not 
seeing the emergence of those over the horizon yeah. um, trends that were kind of flying at us full steam ahead. <laughs> and those guys hooked on the back of it. So we'd sort of spent the first 10 years um, bringing offline product online and creating um, the experience. And I think what those guys really nailed was um, raising a lot of capital <laughs> and building beautiful product and um, getting that growth viral engine right. So how did their entry change the way you operated your strategy? Yeah, so you never realize you're getting strangled by a boa constrictor until, <laughs> um, you know, you, you take your last breath. Um, and while, you know, that hasn't fully occurred, I guess um, what Airbnb, um, you know, I guess what they did was they, yeah, I, I, in terms of whether I'll talk too much about their, their sort of penetration of the Australian market, I think they had a great brand, they had a great growth engine, and, um, you know, they, they seeded the market appropriately. And, um, yeah, it was such a great experience that created referrals and word of mouth, and, um, you know, it's become very successful. It's grown the market, so I think all players have grown, but they've certainly taken uh, a lot of share. And, um, you know, really brought short-term rentals and uh, short-term accommodation to, to the mainstream. Yeah. So you mentioned mobile a little bit um, and how they kind of nailed that. Uh, what are some of the ways that, you know, mobile is going to continue to change the industry? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, I've kind of stepped away from the, the short-term accommodation <laughs> space. I had um, a sabbatical. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think everything's mobile these days. You've really got to think mobile first. Um, that's a cliche. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just a fact of life. So if you're not designing for mobile, particularly for the younger generation that will be the main segment of consumers in the next sort of three to five years, um, you're, not, you're not building for the future. Do you think that there are still some things that are broken with the industry and maybe not just short-term rentals, but real estate in general? Yeah, so um, the short-term rental market, I think, um, is no longer broken, it's fixed. Okay. And um, <laughs> it's just going to become even more and more awesome. Um, so that's great, and those guys will go on to do really well um, both at Stays and Airbnb. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of the real estate market, uh, it's broken, and um, that's an area that we're, we're going to try and uh, get involved in. So what are some of the ways that it's broken? Yeah, so, um, you know, when we look around at the, the real estate space, um, we're focusing on the rental market. Mm -hmm. um, we just, we look around, we see that people are not really having a good time, and they're not having a good time because... Um, there are significant pain points, um, hip pocket costs and um, heartache as well. And we think it's because um, there's a fundamental problem sort of matching the, the personas. Um, so, you know, think generation rent with um, investor speculators. Just when you've moved in, you think you're getting settled. Um, someone wants to renovate and flip that property and, and vice versa um, with, you know, short-term tenants and rent vestors or, or long-term self-managed super funds. So we think there's a fundamental problem um, with the mismatch in the market. We also think the process is, is highly inefficient. Mm -hmm. So you're offline, you're online, you're dealing with this person, dealing with that person. So we want to try and bring that together. And um, I think the third, the third problem in the real estate rental space is um, there's not a lot of choice. And so you've got binary options in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And I think without information and choice, um, it becomes stressful, it becomes costly, and um, that's what we're trying to address. Have you had much experience with real estate markets around the world? I haven't actually. Um, so we've researched you know, the US and the UK, and um, yeah, we, we'd like to think that we've got quite a unique um, model and a unique take on things. Do you think they're facing the same problems, or if, is there someone out there who may be or a that has solved this? Yeah, so when I look around the world, um, you know, there are very few markets that are as, um, uh, as heated as the Australian market. I think we've got quite unique di dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I would love to sit in a room and not talk real estate. <laughs> you know, if you, think of, if you think of our basic needs, um, food, water, shelter, why does Australia spend so much time talking about property? We should take it for granted. Why are we encouraging um, 
the, the young generation to buy the most expensive real estate in the world and to spend 30 years um, paying it off. Um, I know we're an island, but we're not Manhattan or Hong Kong. Um, so <laughs> we've got a supply issue and policymakers and the market are really driving demand um, and not solving the problem. And I'd love to live in a world where we didn't talk about sort of <laughs> property and whether we're renovating fluffing cushions, you know, throwing <laughs> throws on sofas. But I'd love to be in a world where we had housing affordability, which is defined as housing security. And so we're really talking about a world where there's multi-year leases and there's trust and transparency um, and a sense that you can go about doing other things than worrying about property. Mm. And I think if you walked into a financial planner and said, hey, I want to buy one asset class, I want to take a 30-year loan, I want to leverage to 90%, they'd say, you don't need financial advice, you need a doctor. <laughs> and um, that's what we're doing. So we'd love to reposition the conversation away from how do I get into the housing market at the highest priced property in the world to how do I get housing stability and separate the emotional from the financial decision and go off and invest in startups or buy 5% of 20 other properties and get diversification and get exposure to other markets. So you mentioned that you sold your home to start your business, but uh, I did read somewhere online that you were named a real estate tycoon because your house went for sale. So how did that come about and you know, how did you make so much money off that? Yeah, so it was, um, it, it was good buying. Okay. And um, the reason I sold my home was because, um, you know, mid last year I started to think about this venture, uh, snug, and I thought about the renting world and I thought, you know, look, I really believe in authenticity and I believe in um, being sort of true to brand. So for me to live um, in a home and not rent wasn't compatible with um, my purpose and my vision. So yeah, I went about um, <laughs> selling my house and I rent a great one bedroom um, just, you know, on the fringe of the city. And I love it because I deal with my rental agent <laughs> and I get all the insights. Um, and I'm also a landlord as well. So I've got a place uh, up in Byron Bay and I rent that out and I get the experiences with my tenant. So what have you learned? Yeah, so I've learned that it's really broken. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I reflected on um, uh, a call that I had with my, my tenant up in Byron Bay and uh, we're chatting for an hour on the phone. And I'm not saying that every rental situation needs to be social, but um, <laughs> yeah, you know you're in a good place when the rent's paid, I look after repairs and maintenance uh, as required by the tenant. Mm -hmm. um, they keep me in touch with um, how the property's going, what needs to be done, um, how they're settling in and what their intentions are. Okay, that's, I mean, that's awesome. So, I mean, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing with Snug. What exactly is it? What can you tell us? Yeah, sure. So, um, what Snug's trying to do is, is really create a better way to rent. Um, we think the rental market's broken. We see those, those three problems I mentioned around the matching, the efficiency of the process, and um, the third pain point, which is choice. And so we're trying to create a platform which, um, which solves those pain points by providing uh, software uh, for property owners to, to manage their property, um, to provide a marketplace which provides choice around products and services and really to provide an experience that creates a rental community where you could be both a renter um, as I am, you could be um, a landlord as well and you have a 360 uh, degree sort of persona in the marketplace and we break down this sort of hierarchical um, arrangement of just owners, agents and tenants and we move to a place where we have greater transparency, we, we have um, expectations around standards and behaviours which make people accountable, um, that motivate them to be good actors in a marketplace. And we think that we can fundamentally um, redefine the experience and we can um, lower the costs and deliver better value in the marketplace. 
That's awesome. So what would your advice be to anyone else who wanted to you know, break in and create some new innovation in that space? In, in, in the real estate space in, in general. <laughs> in the real estate space? Look, you know, it's, it's a big and complex market. Um, and there are a number of players which have a lot of momentum. And, uh, you know, I think for us, understanding the segments, um, the barriers, the blockers, the enablers has been an important part of um, validating the product. And we're still working towards our product market fit and we'll sort of launch when we're, <laughs> we've got that nailed down. And we're also thinking carefully about our go-to-market strategy and how we penetrate a very well-established market with established behaviours and mindsets. And what we want to do is sort of start in people's comfort zone and uh, start to push their comfort zone <laughs> to, to a new place. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about some of your investments now. So we'll switch over to the kind of startup sure. side of things. So um, you've made 12 investments so far, that's right? Uh, 23, and I'll close that one more this way weekend. Off there. <laughs> <laughs> about a dozen, okay. two dozen. <laughs> so we've doubled that. Okay, that's that's amazing. So um, tell me how you got how you got into it. Um, you know, you do focus on kind of the SaaS side of things, a bit of IoT. Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, you know, I finished a 15-year journey uh, back in August of 2015. So I thought, well, look, I'll treat myself to 15 months off. Um, for, for 15 years service. <laughs> and so Makes sense. I got on a, another jet plane and um, you know, I went to Burning Man just to decompress, go out to the desert <laughs> and do stuff. I also went out to West Coast uh, conferences and I did that too. Um, and I went to you know, New York to meet VCs and hang out there. And um, yeah, I, I started actively sort of investing over the course of that year. And I had a couple of investments through um, engaging with the Sydney Angels, which is a great group. And um, I, yeah, I started to invest in um, areas that I was familiar with. So um, SaaS businesses, marketplace businesses. And I guess through my year and a half sabbatical, I had kind of three lines of inquiry. One was looking at um, over the horizon trends um, the second was, was exploring the, the verticals, you know, VR, AI, IoT, etc., and looking at these new tech buckets. And the third was exploring other business models that I wasn't f so familiar with. And um, yeah, I, I made the decision to, um, to put about a mill back into the startup system and um, deploy it through um, a range of angel investments. And I started to focus on um, prop tech, fintech, a little bit of IoT, uh, labor markets, and food and beverage. And I've got a mix of um, SaaS and marketplace businesses. Um, yeah, and so I've been a fairly active angel investor in the sense that I have um, spent time with the founders and just given time, networked with hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of of founders, yeah. um, whether it's going through pitch decks or financial models or whatever, but really trying to, um, you know, encourage them and give them the resources to, to you know, realize their dream. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hopefully, we have some here tonight as well um, that could one day be on your list. Um, so, what are some of the ways that you help the startup? So, obviously, you're very engaged, you're active in their lives. Um, what are some of the things that you know you're doing to help them? Yeah. So. Um, some of the startups I've, I've joined the board, um, others I just sort of mentor. Mm -hmm. But I think um, for most startups, I'm able to share an experience of a journey that I've had and for them to, um, to get a better sense of what that track looks like <laughs> up that Himalayan range and to be able to sort of um, sit down with you and talk about, um, you know, like, deep issues. Maybe it's founder sort of tensions or disputes. Maybe it's sort of strategy. Maybe it's about making sort of risky decisions to go left or right on product. And really being able to sort of um, cut through the BS and, and give them some short, frank advice um, to, to listen and to kind of understand exactly and empathize with them. Yeah. I think they find that useful as, as a sounding board, which, um, you know, they might not get from perhaps their financiers or from other directors that come from the domain 
um, that have the expertise, but maybe haven't had the founder journey as well. So yeah, I just try and share my experiences and give them an ear to, to, to talk to. So when you come across one of those difficult problems, maybe it's you know founder tension or whatever it is, what are, how do you approach that? How do you help them solve that problem? Yeah, so I think um, so much of it's about um, information gathering and you know, there are lots of little decisions, but there are some really big decisions that you make. Mm -hmm. And being able to I, just be present and know that, shit, this is one of those really big decisions. <laughs> so um, gathering the information, doing the analysis, um, and doing what I didn't do, which is getting out of that silo of secrecy and um, stealth and networking, talking to people. And you know, I think you find that people are so willing to share these days which is one of the amazing things with the US startup system. And I just encourage everyone to <laughs> accept those LinkedIn requests and uh, <laughs> you know, take those calls and go for coffees and just give back. Um, because the more you can sort of socialize that problem um, and learn from perhaps um, other experiences in, in other industries that are analogous, um, it helps you make better decisions. Yeah, de-risk it. Well, you did. You answered my cold email, so thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Um, so do you recommend startups if, you know, I, maybe I just have an idea, like, should I be out there talking about it and telling people? Yeah, so it depends what sort of industry you're in and um, what your startup idea is. Um, you know, if you're planning on lodging a patent, um, you know, <laughs> maybe not. Um, if you haven't got capital to build a marketplace, maybe not. Um, but, you know, I think uh, it's with your discretion, you, yeah share it with, with your trusted advisors, get some traction. Um, and um, yeah, by talking about it, you can certainly um, learn more and get on the road to success. So are all of the startups that you invest in doing well? Or have any of them run into huge issues? I mean, are they all still alive? <laughs> yeah, so one's dead. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> That's pretty good odds, though. Yeah, so I was just looking at my sort of paper ROI, okay. and um, you know that's healthy. Um, and I've got a couple that are stellar, and I've got a bunch in the middle that are doing okay. And I'm still reading the emails um, <laughs> and taking the calls. And uh, yeah, look in any portfolio, and this is why I sort of decided to um, take more of a diversification approach, mm -hmm. um, so that I'd have a couple of winners, a couple that do well, um, a few that would be stragglers and um, a couple that would, you know, not see the light of day. <laughs> oh no. Which is kind of good because, you know, if you get to a place where um, that particular um, business model's not working, great, shut you it down. Something. Get on to the next thing. You've learned some lessons yeah. and you haven't spent your whole life and a, a whole lot more money than you need to <laughs> working out it wasn't a great idea. So what does Stellar mean? What, are, what do they look like? Yeah, so, um, you know, Stellar's kind of doing like 6x in six months. Okay. And that's, you know, that's healthy. Yeah. I'll, I'd take that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what does not so stellar look like? What about the m kind of middle ground? You know, when you look at big retailers in Australia that are rolling out big hardware stores and they're doing double digit growth and you see a digital startup doing kind of that and a bit more, that's not super exciting. Um, you know, I, I remember meeting with, um, I remember meeting with someone who went on to sell their business for uh, nearly a billion dollars. Wow. And, um, you know, he said to me, we're growing a thousand percent in 10 different countries. It's like, yeah, I'm doing 80 something. <laughs> and it, that was just a real um, benchmark for me yeah. about how digital businesses really need to crank growth to be relevant. Yeah. And if you're doing sort of, yeah, double digits, it doesn't kind of cut the mustard, you know. Yeah. What about the ones that didn't do so well, maybe that are kind of struggling, they're falling behind, they're going to be in your black book soon. What happened? What went wrong? Was it something that was in their control? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, there's, a real, um, there's a real drive to kind of do everything at once and go out wide. Mm -hmm. And I see some businesses trying to scale and move quickly by spreading their product set rather than really refining the core product and what that experience should be for their key segment. And, you know, they see adding product features 
um, and expanding that suite as being the fastest way to win over customers. And I think that's, it spreads your resources thin and you just don't get better at your core, your core process. I think the other thing is um, not being as ambitious around um, sales. Um, so, you know, in Australia, perhaps we're not as um, sales driven as, as the States, but um, taking a really active um, sales approach. So compressing sales cycles, trying to get, you know, annual subscriptions that drop cash into your um, into your bank rather than a sort of 12-month SaaS sort of program. So really thinking smart about how to accelerate the, the growth rather than just keep building out a product set, um, I think is one of the challenges that I see. The other is, um, you know, a lot of young founders perhaps haven't managed teams, haven't developed strategies, and so being able to empower people to empower your team members to go on and do great things rather than um, yeah, taking a more sort of um, prescriptive approach or having a, a less coordinated approach. And so I think that I see strategic um, plans and kind of key milestones are not as well um, chalked out. And so the team's busy, but perhaps not all running in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Are there any startups that you mentor that you haven't invested in? Yeah, good question. Look, I... Um, I take calls all the time from, from startups. There's a great import-export business I've met with half a dozen times, and <laughs> I haven't invested, um, haven't been asked, haven't asked, um, but I just kept, have coffees and catch up sort of every month or two. Now that I'm in the snug world, um, <laughs> I'm being a lot more res sort of uh, restrictive with my time, but yeah. What about the question, I get this all the time, uh, you must do as well, uh, should you go for investment or not? What, what do you say? Because obviously you didn't when you first business, for your first business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think if investment's all about the size of your market and what type of um, product you've got, if you've got, um, you know, viral sort of, l there are lots of great Australian examples that have bootstrapped um, to unicorn status, yeah. you know, the Atlassians, the Envados, the, you name them, campaign <laughs> managers, uh, etc. Um, I think, you know, if your ROI is greater than the cost of um, the capital, you know, go for it. Um, I think one of my biggest mistakes was not raising funds. Okay. And it's kind of interesting, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> down at this little incubator and there's a $75 million fund next door. And every morning when I walk past their office, I go like that. And <laughs> they think I'm saying good morning. I'm just saying five mil. <laughs> and I get a little wave back and it's like, yeah, cool. It's like six, <laughs> uh, you know. So you need capital to grow without a doubt. And yeah. you need capital because you need to, you need to um, attract the right caliber of people. You need capital to, to get out to your customers. And um, that, takes, that takes time, that takes money. <laughs> so raise your money. Okay. Yeah. Is there any other kind of broad advice um, that you give to all of the startups that you mentor or invest in? Yeah, um, a good question. Yeah, I think one of the things that's really missing in the ecosystem is um, the soft skills development. And so you see, um, you know, a lot of the, the startup workshops are all around growth hacking, um, around product and sales strategies and so forth. But I think the soft skills around being a great founder and leader that's aspirational yeah. as well as perspirational <laughs> um, that can really inspire a team, give them purpose, um, because purpose pays a lot more than a package. And so, you know, I think for Australian um, startups, um, or for any startup really, you know, globally, just focusing on the soft skills of being a, a better founder, a better leader, um, that can inspire your team to uh, achieve great things is, is one thing that's missing in the market. So you obviously invest in early stage businesses. What are the key factors to surviving that super early stage when you're pre-revenue, you gotta get through it. How do you, yeah, how do you survive? Yeah, you've, you've gotta keep costs low okay. and really focus on, on getting to um, break even. So generating revenue and becoming self-sufficient. So um, that means, you know, not paying yourself a lot as a founder so, you know, I went for three years without drawing a salary and uh, from the business. And so, as an investor to see founders, um, you know, uh, 
spreadsheeting six-figure salaries as part of their financial models. You know, that's, a, that's a lot of cash drawdown from uh, funds that are being raised. So really keeping costs lo low, driving towards um, uh, you know, break even, if possible, is, is critical. Yeah. Um, any last advice for us before I wrap it up and hand it over to the audience for questions? Yeah, I say just you know, go for it. If you've got an idea out there, um, do your homework, research the market, connect with people, and uh, giving a shot. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very satisfying, and I hope uh, it's rewarding for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's give that a big round of applause.